Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to a new week. We're going to kick off this one with a series on researching like the pros. And to get us started, we have two of the very best, Tony Greer, editor of The Morning Navigator, and Jared Dillian, editor of The Daily Dirt Nap. Hey, guys. Good morning, hey, Maggie. Maggie. How are you doing? Good, good. So we are doing this. Listen, we're in a period of rapid change, increased volatility. We talk all the time with you guys and all the guests we have on about how it's a really sort of difficult environment one with a lot of opportunity, but difficult to navigate. We're kind of maybe moving into something different. So we wanted to take the time this week to talk a little bit about how each of us can use research to be smarter investors. Um, so we thought it would be great to talk to each of you about the sort of process and the framework you used. Um, so why don't we why don't we start out with maybe a little bit of your background? And I'm, and I'm interested to hear from each of you if you kind of remember when you went from the beginning, how you were operating to kind of establishing your own system. Um, so Jared, why don't you kick us off? Do you kind of remember that transition where you were like, okay, wait a minute, like I'm, I'm starting to get a handle on this and I'm starting to create my own idea about how I operate? Yeah. I mean, when I first started the newsletter in 2008, um, I was really looking forward to having time to research. You know, and I said to myself, I'm like, I'm going to subscribe to all these newsletters. I'm going to subscribe to Jim Grant and all these, you know, smart people. And, you know, I'm going to have hours a day to read all this stuff. And, you know, it actually, uh, one of the things, I, I don't know if you remember this, but back in 2008, this was kind of before Twitter. And this is when financial blogs were a big thing. Um, so I was reading a lot of blogs and, I did this for about a year and I'm like, this, this is a terrible process because what I'm doing is I'm reading other people's opinions about things. Mm -hmm. Right. And so when you read opinions, you sort of co-opt them as your own and it's not really your own ideas. So after about a year of doing that, I said, I am never reading opinion ever again. So I unsubscribed from the newsletters and I stopped reading the blogs and I literally just started reading news articles, like just facts. And that was, that was the turning point for me, you know, and that's really what I've been doing for the last 15 or 16 years. So. Yeah. Helping get to get your own original thinking into it. Yep. Um, and I think that's, I think that's a really interesting point because we talk about sort of in the academy and other places about building your own framework, right? Because only you know what's relevant to you, what your risk profile is, but there are a lot of opinions. And you know, we see it all the time. Every headline is sort of clickbait about what you should do, what you should buy, what you should treat, but it's not, it's not kind of a one size fits all. So Tony, what about you? Do you remember where you kind of made that transition? Yeah, I, I would say I had two transitions. I had the one transition where I realized that me looking at the world and putting on positions based on what I thought was going to happen. The realization that that was a losing proposition was one sort of wake up call I had and got tired of losing money and decided to figure out how to make money. And that was, you know, some, kind of probably five to seven years into my trading career of kind of piddling around with, with, you know, kind of small amounts of money, trying to get acquainted to markets and feeling them with my own, you know, flesh and blood and understanding what that emotion was going to be like. And then the next one was definitely to kind of, uh, you know, echo what my man JD was saying, when you start working for yourself, you are no longer, you know, like burdened by the duty to do anything for anyone else, you know, other than for your own process. And so when it became time to start writing the newsletter in 2016, that's kind of when I, similar to Jared started saying, okay, I got to decide what I think about markets now so that I have a clear view and I can profess my own ideas. Like kind of like JD was like, I don't want anybody else's ideas crawling around in my head and influencing what I think. So I, when I started the newsletter is when I really beefed up my sort of market watch spreadsheet where, mm -hmm. you know, I monitor the closes of things on a weekly and monthly and quarterly basis and kind of follow where the market's going and use that as a little bit of a map in as much as I can. And then refining that skill over the last seven years to 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 come to a really comfortable point in, in understanding the risk that I have on and when I want to be in it and when I want to be out and, and having really 
surrendered control of the book to what the market tells me kind of thing. Yeah. So it's interesting in, in both of your cases. First of all, I think there's an idea that people have that um, that they got to gonna be perfect out of the gate or somehow like there's people who know and people who don't instead of it just being a process that you create. And both of you sort of, it sounds like this was a process. Jared, what do you feel like changed when you started kind of creating your own ideas? Did you become more disciplined? Was it more organized? Like what was the, what was the change that happened? Well, first of all, you know, you, you never should have brought me on this show because <laughs> like my process is very different from other people's. So I don't do any quantitative research at all. I do qualitative research, right? So if I'm going to research a stock or a country or something like that, I pull up a bunch of news articles and I read news articles and I look for language in the news article so I can get clues on sentiment, right? And I actually, I actually have an assistant. So, you know, I have the assistant pull all the articles for me and print them out and stuff like that. Um, what I've found over the years is that the amount of research that I do into a trade is not necessarily correlated to the success of the trade, right? Like I've had some trades like, you know, my whole short candidate thesis from 10 years ago, like I did more research on Canadian housing than any other trade that I've ever done. And it, and it was my worst idea, you know, and I've had some trades where I've, where I just like pulled up a chart or something and I'm like, Hey, cool chart. And I buy the stock and it's like, you know, it goes up a hundred percent. So like there's there there's no correlation at all as to like how much you know research you do and also i've started to come to the opinion that like more information isn't necessarily better and a mm -hmm. good idea can usually be summed up in a sentence if you have an idea that has all these moving parts and it's very complex and stuff like that it's probably not going to work the best idea is you can sum up in a sentence or an elevator pitch or something like that so I like to keep it really, really simple, you know. That is why we asked you on the show, Jared, because everybody has a different approach and it can't all be the same. There are lots of different inputs, right? And we know that you're you're a sentiment person and, you know, Raul always says one of the best out there. Um, but, and that's your framework that you operate on. And it's incredibly helpful <laughs> to people who are maybe looking at different things. And the other thing I think, Tony, is that people have different, people have different time frames they have different goals they have different lengths and we talk to you a lot about trading strategies um because of all your time and i see you nodding when you when jared said sometimes the more complex the idea you can kind of get lost in it i feel like you tell us a lot too you're like listen what's the market telling me did, did you did, did it help you get some clarity once you kind of locked into building the kind of framework you operate off of yeah, well, you know, at least at least then I knew that there was something more powerful than my brain trying to tell me what was going on, right? And and that being the market, you know, so being led to, you know, the one thing that I can notice is, um, you know, I'm 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 visually oriented, so one thing that I notice is when something performs several times in a row, like my memory kicks in and say, oh, this is the sector that's been up three weeks in a row, and it kind of, you know, I'm not going to say that that's the answer to the trade, but a little bit it tells you a little bit about where to look. And then when I go about the rest of my process, which is sort of overlaying where that move is within the technical framework and totally understanding sort of JD's viewpoint about where we are in the sentiment of the framework of the trade, you know, then the trades start to jump out at you when the stars kind of align, you know, whoops, mm -hmm. we have a technical breakout here where everyone's bearish and everyone's short. And there's, you know, there's a lot of room on the upside on the chart. Like, Sometimes those are the ones that represent themselves, like JD said, where you look at the chart and you're like, oh man, everybody's bearish, they're short, this thing's breaking out, just buy this. I don't have any, you know, I have nothing holding me back from those kind of trades. So yeah, yeah. It's, it's a freeing experience when you get that overlay of things that sort of all line up and then you don't have to do any more research. You know, you put the trade on, you manage the risk, so. Yeah, um, I, I and I, I really, really remember that day we were talking in November, right before that monster rally. It was exactly that. You're like, wait a minute, I'm seeing this stuff. And and not that you were there beforehand, because we were all kind of at this point where we were looking at rates and suddenly these things fell into place for you and you were like super, super bullish, which at the time was 
you know, no one was really saying. And so it felt like that we, we sort of saw that moment because it was at the end of that day. You're like, wait a minute, what's going on? Today was really important. Exactly, Maddie. So, you know, on a day that, you know, when you're sitting here going through the grind of the market days that don't speak to you very much, you know, you'll notice that there'll be one or two stocks that, you know, spark up on the upside and have huge moves and a couple that are, you know, fall apart on the downside. On a day when 17 sectors have major magnitude moves in the same direction and they all or most of them break major technical resistance levels on the way. I mean, the, scream is, the screens are screaming at you at that point, right? They're like, get this message out. Like, what are you observing? There's something going on that is not to be faded. So it's when those sort of bells and alarms that the market sends off start going off all at once that you can you can read that statement that the market's making and go with it. Yeah. Jared, what, uh, both of you talked about sort of there's so much noise out there and and Tony was just talking about getting out of your own brain. For somebody who watches sentiment, how do you grapple with that? Because you have ideas. Like I know you were watching Argentina really early when people weren't watching it. And, and you know, we're all human beings, right? We love stories. We love narrative. How do you kind of back test that when you're, when you're thinking about something, you like an idea, but, you know, Tony just mentioned kind of getting freed up from getting too locked into your own brain and thinking, how, how do you balance those two things? Well, first of all, the Argentina trade wasn't really a sentiment trade. Um, you know, there's, I kind of have this um, belief that when an economically unfree country becomes an economically free country, um, you're looking at, you know, multiple triple digit percentage growth, like over time. So that wasn't really a sentiment trade. Um, you know, in terms of my research for sentiment, like just say, for example, uh, you, you know, I wanted to research corn, okay? I would go into the Twitter search box and type in corn or hashtag corn or something like that. And I would look through all the tweets and I look at the comments from people, you know? Uh, Twitter's an amazingly useful tool. So... Um, you, you know, as you know, corn broke $4 today. So now we have $3 corn. I actually haven't done this yet, but I intended to do it later today. I actually wanted to like search for the tweets on corn and see where people's heads are at. You know, um, I, the, the type of, the type of comments I'm looking for is, uh, something is relentless or something is unstoppable, or this is going to go on forever. Or, or you're an idiot down. if you're long corn, <laughs> you know, like that's, that's the type of stuff I look for. And that, that's what gets me interested. So. Yeah. Tony just said it can't go down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, one of JD's best calls ever was when he decided at $135 oil, that sentiment was just too bullish and he didn't give a flying rat's ass about how little oil there was in inventory because we had reached peak sentiment and then oil went down 60% in five days or something like that. So it's like, it's really powerful tool when he's got a handle on it. Yeah. Um, I, I think that uh, the too many assholes in uranium was also another. Uh... <laughs> oh, that was oh, a... uranium. Those uranium people came at you too, Jared, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> that was a perfect, that perfectly lines up with what we're talking about, Maggie. Two weeks ago, there was no uranium and you couldn't say anything bearish on Twitter without getting shoes thrown at you. And, you know, I, I, I'm on tape on video saying this is exactly when the uranium market breaks because all the bulls are in it. They're long. They think it can't go down. And guess what Mr. Market is about to introduce them to? A big sell-off. And that's exactly what's going on right now. So, you know, luckily some of the pros made a couple of good escapes out of that trade, but it's the way that the sentiment lines up, man. It's really, really powerful. And, and JD is the best at sniffing it out. You know, it, it strikes me as I talk to you, we're all, we're spoiled. We talk to you all the time. We have a lot of fun on the daily briefings. We joke around when you're on together, we joke around about this, but it's, you're not just shooting for the, from the hip. I think it's kind of important to point that out because um, you have great turns of phrases and um, and a great sense of humor, both of you. But there is a process. I think that's kind of what we're trying to shine a light on. There is something that's going on. You're not just bullshitting. Um, you're looking at things, and it's why you're both able to catch things early. And both of you are on the record with us being very contrarian at times and or 
um, leaving behind what people think you think. And Tony, we've talked about this with commodities and everybody thought you were a, not a tech ball, that you were permanently bearish tech and hated everything tech, which was absolutely not true. It was just at the moment. And I think it's important to point that out. Yeah, right? you know, yeah, the way to look at it is that we're, you know, we're in everything for the trade. You know, and I, I mean, I don't, I don't really get the sense that JD is a dogmatic type trader either, where, where he would be, you know, kind of one way in something, no matter what you throw at him, you know, we're, 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 you know, we're people that realize that markets change and, and move on sentiment. And that's where the money is made, you know, like at the extremes. And so it's got nothing to do with the fundamentals most of the time when the stock is doing one thing and sentiment and tech, you know, tactical trading and price action are doing another, you know, and it takes a long time to be able to separate out the positive sentiment flying around your head and be able to make a sale into that. Like I, I finally learned a long time ago that if I'm high-fiving somebody that's in a position with me because we're making so much money, I better be making a sale with the other hand. Because whenever I forget to make a sale and I only high five, I always give money back, you know? So if you're ever going to learn it, you have to be really uncomfortable and be like, oh my God, they're ripping each other's arms off for this thing that I'm long, sold, right? You got to be able to feed the ducks when the sentiment lines up and everybody wants it. So that's another way of looking at it. Yeah. J Jared, I think this is uh, one of the things where I'm curious to hear from you, I would say one of the things is timing, doing exactly what you just said, Tony, we get a lot of questions on that. Um, Jared, what do you hear uh, from your clients? What do they struggle with the most? Well, first of all, I want to say this is this is super important. I, I, this just came into my head and I just want to get this point across. Um, there's a rule of marketing that you have to hear about a product six times before you buy it. Right. So let's say you hear about this fancy electronic cat litter box and somebody mentions it to you and you're like, oh, that's interesting. And then you forget about it. And then you see a Facebook ad. You're like, oh, I think I've heard about that before. And then you see a commercial and then two more people talk to you. And by the sixth time you've heard about it, you're like, OK, I'm going to buy the litter box. Right. The same thing is true of stocks. OK. It, or any trade, but stocks. If somebody gives you a stock tip, you're like, oh, okay, I'll look into that. And you have to hear about it six times before you finally act on it. But by then it is too late. It's too late. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I've trained myself to do over the years is if somebody gives me an idea, I, I look it up immediately. I research it immediately. Okay. And then I have a saying. And the saying is invest, then investigate, right? Because markets move fast. And if you have a good idea, you want to put it on immediately and then go do the research. If the research doesn't confirm your initial idea, you can always get out of the trade, right? But if it does confirm your initial idea, then you can add to the trade. So that's basically what I try to do. Like the first time I hear about something, I, I do a little bit of research and then invest, then investigate, which goes contrary to what people are taught in the CFA program and stuff like that. Like you're supposed to research the hell out of a stock before you buy it. And the thing about that is, is that people get lazy about research. It's effort, right? So they're like, ah, you know, I'll, I'll do the research on this stock next week, the week after, whatever. And then they end up not doing it. And then the stock runs away from them and it's too late. So you just described, I think, everybody's experience <laughs> right now because things move it with lightning speed. Do you think we that it's such an it's such an interesting concept? Uh, do you think by putting a little money in something, you're more committed to it as well? And oh yeah, we'll follow like once through. You, once you buy the stock, now you have risk on right. So now you will actually do the research. But people get paralysis by analysis, right? They're like, oh, like I gotta, I gotta do all this research on the stock. And yeah, they, they, they do it in the wrong order. So, That's but you at least have to take a starter position. Yeah. I, I just want to, uh, I just want to also throw in, we were talking a lot about you being a sentiment person, but you look at charts and prices too, I think, Jared, if I'm not Oh mistaken. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we, we talk a lot about sentiment, but I, I think, I, I think we, we need to sort of fill in that there's, 
there's more to the framework as well. And it sounds like you're putting pieces together. You're very keen on the sentiment. It's the part that interests you and where your gut takes you. But you're you're balancing it with more than just one component. Is that fair to say? Like what what else are you it what's in the in the pot when you're looking at something? Basically sentiment and technicals. I do look at charts. Um and the best trades are when the two line up, when the sentiment and the technicals line up. So for example, uh back around 4,800, 4780 in the S P, um, I took a shot on the short side, which was purely based on technicals. And it worked for two or three days, and then I got stopped out. And the reason it didn't work was because the sentiment and the technicals did not match up. The sentiment was mm-hmm. not extended enough for that to work. So, so the two go hand in hand. Yeah. Tony, what do you what do you feel like your clients struggle? Well, we just talked about the fact that you got a kick and slack, which I'm psyched we know about now. Because I'm going to ask you about it all the time. Um, yeah. But what, what do you what do you think you are? Why is this happening? Does anybody that else see the wild. balloons going up? Yeah. <laughs> well, did I just get a bonus question or something? That was amazing. You must have said the super, you know, super secret code word that unlocked the balloons, Maggie. What did you um, say? I don't know, but I gotta, I gotta do it again. Maybe something else will pop up. But um, what, what do you, what do you think your clients uh, struggle with a lot? What do you hear about a lot? Yeah, you know, the thing that I try to to instruct the most, I think, in in you know the Slack channel, which is kind of an ongoing study on trading and markets, and is fun. But I, I try to teach guys with less experience that you can be bullish and make sales. You know, it's like you can be bullish, but when you perceive something to be at the top of the range or someplace where sentiment is freaking out or someplace where it's all stop loss buying, you got to learn to be happy about that, but learn to be able to make a sale so that you're less long at the highs because that's more important than being most bullish at the highs, right? And it's like a thing that you want to say, like, you know, kind of like an oil when oil was on the way down and like people would come up to me and be like, oh, you bullish oil, you bullish oil. And I'd be like, I'm not bullish oil at all. You know, oil looks like it's on the way down to me. I'm not bullish there. And, you know, when, when oil becomes a good buy, I'll talk about, you know, buying it. And that's another thing that, that guys struggle with. I'll, I'll have something that I'm bullish on the view matrix and bullish isn't a position yet. Bullish is just a sort of view, meaning I have it on my radar and I may go long and I'll establish a level where I would bid for that security. And I'll have guys come into me in like DMs and say like, Hey, do you think we should buy some here? Or do you think we should buy some here? And I'd look at the chart and be like, why? Like, it's not a good buy. It's not anywhere. Mm-hmm. And just because I'm bullish something, let's buy it when it's a good buy. Let's buy it when, you know, as we used to say on the floor, you know, when a paper broker comes in and smashes it down, you know, a couple of percent, let's buy it there, you know, and not worry about, you know, what, you know, that, that we need to get it on the pad. Now let's buy things when they're a good buy and you can be bullish and make good sales. Like the, the saying down on the floor was like, that's what the badge is for. Right. And you'd show somebody the badge mm-hmm. saying like, yeah, I'm bullish, but I shorted 500 lots to the guy that came in and was buying on a stop loss into technical resistance. Right. So that's a trade that works also, you know, like you're fading sentiment, you're fading a guy that's stopping out at resistance. And it's like, yeah, you could be bullish that security, but put that trade on because that trade lines up, you know, and it's just trying to get that thinking, that limber thinking to people um, who want to have a view and establish it and keep it forever and ride their security into the stratosphere when they can retire and never have to work again. And it don't work that way. Yeah, Jared, I think this is the I think this is the um the the kind of danger of everyone going for the 10 bagger. Someone sent me something this morning. I think Warren Buffett put it in his annual report about like the whole market seems like a casino all the time now. You know, we know Warren is more of a traditionalist, but he does make a point that everyone seems to be going for like the the, the killer trade that they're gonna be able to retire on immediately. Um, do do you find that you come up come up against that, Jared, especially if you talk in sentiment, that's the thing that feeds into that feeling of narrative. Like, I believe that, you know, Tesla is a great example of this, I think. There are hardcore Elon fans that believe he is like the next coming and, you know, uh, can do no wrong. And I think that guides their trading and investing but then they struggle when things are, you know, it, that, that's, a, that's a super example. How, how, are, how do you think about that? You know, what do you tell clients that that are kind of like Tony said, just just a- anxious to get a, get that winning trade? 
Well, first of all, conviction can be good, but conviction can also be bad. And conviction in a lot of cases is being impervious to opposing points of view, right? Yeah. Like, so there's, there's such a thing as too much conviction. And getting back to your an earlier point about how people are looking for retirement trades and stuff like that, there's a phenomenon today, which I didn't really see up until about 2021, but people are basically behaving in such a way that it's infinity or zero, right? They buy a stock and they're one of two outcomes is going to happen. It's going to go to infinity or it's going to go to zero. And they're just going to hold on no matter what. Well, nothing ever goes to infinity. So inevitably it always goes to zero, right? Mm -hmm. So people, people will take, like, I've never, I've never seen such a lack of discipline in the markets. Like people are psychologically prepared to take 80% drawdowns on stuff. You know, I'm a big fan of taking profits. I mean, look, like people say, if you bought Apple in 1986 and you held it to today, then you would have made a hundred thousand percent or whatever. Like that's fine, but like, I'm a big fan of taking profits along the way. And uh, the reason people don't is because they have fear of future regret, right? Th they're afraid that they're going to regret missing out on more gains. Just take the gains, pay the taxes and go on to another trade. Like there's always another yeah. trade. So I think that that really explains part of why we wanted to talk about this this week, because there is this and it, it, it could be a lack of discipline, but it's also the pressure that everyone else has found that unicorn. Everyone got in and NVIDIA has fueled that like nothing else. That's the, you know, it could be Apple, but lately for people, it's been NVIDIA that if you got in early, that that's it. You just needed that one thing. It's causing lack of discipline. And we worry also causing people to put outsized bets on something, maybe without protecting themselves. And Tony, this is something that you talk about all the time. And both you and Jared also are uh, focused on taking money off the table, but protecting yourself in terms of the risk you're taking. And that's part of what you guys focus on as well, correct? Yeah, you know, when you get a position on, and especially if you get it on well and it starts going your way, you got to figure out when to turn seller, right? Because as Jared just pointed out, and we've gone over, things don't go up forever. And what happens to people is they get conditioned response. If they bought Apple a long time ago and they're not really a trader, they'll get lucky by holding it for a long time because they get conditioned response. They get the condition of looking at it and seeing the price go up and the response of folding their arms and saying, beautiful, I don't have to do anything. And eventually, you know, it, it, it gets to a point where they should have done something. And sort of that's the kind of, that, that's the way to approach the market where fat pitches come, if you're really patient and you want to pull 10, 12 trades a year out of the market, you can sit back and wait for fat pitches all day long because I'm confident that I'm going to see 10 or 12 really good ones come over the plate over the course of the year. You know, sometimes you get in trouble when you say, oh, I got to be in this, got to be in that, got to be in this, and you don't have the conviction in those, but they just look okay. You know, mm -hmm. so if you kind of sit back and, you know, God forbid you were ever, you know, had all of your dry powder on a day like November 14th, like we keep talking about, Maggie, when all of those bells went off, if you would have put your first, if you would have had the conviction that stocks were going up from then, like we had and put your first trade on that day, you're, you know, you're, that was a good position to be in, you know, like, cause you sat back and you waited for the fattest pitch of them all, right? That's kind of impossible to do by November, but I'm saying if you kind of structure your strategy and the way you look at the markets like that, you can let a lot of curveballs go by and say, nah, you know, that's not the one that I want to lean into. And then when you find the one, it's usually the one that's kind of screaming in your ear where at, at our point in, in, you know, probably experience wise, JD and I like are automatically putting it on like, okay, I'm not sure if this works or not, but let's start moving some money into this. Yeah. You know? And that's I sort think of that's how the what... trade evolves. I think that's what um, you guys are teaching people with the newsletter. So, because I don't think the rest of us, um, it's it's such muscle memory for you now that you see those pitches. The rest of us are like, wait, is that the pitch? I'm trying to find the pitch. So, I mean, that, that, but, but I know what you're talking about. Um, Jared, what do you, what's a, what do you think a, a good hack is that you have or something that makes the research process easier for you? 
or, or, or most beneficial for you? I think we just, by the way, we already talked about a couple because you both mentioned, um, you know, like some serious pro tips and, and invest and then investigate with one of them. Tony, you talked about um, high five on one hand and taking money off the table with the other one, which are both amazing. Uh, I think people should just like print those out and put them on your bulletin board in front of your monitor or tape them on your mo- post it on your monitor. But um, any any sort of final thoughts, Jared, about advice you'd give people as we're all trying to introduce a little bit of a discipline? And we keep calling it a framework, right? You have to be loose about it, but you have to have some operating procedure so that you're not just shooting from the hip. Sometimes we get questions from people and it just feels like people are moving with the chat on Twitter or like bouncing around. And we have a lot of conflicting opinions right now. One person says one thing and they're very compelling one day. One person says something and they're very very compelling the next day. And it's like, how do you separate that noise out from the real path we should be on? So what are your thoughts about that? Both of you, as we, as we close up here, Jared, start with you. Well, I, I think that, you know, as if you're an individual trader and you're researching a stock, you just have to know that yes, you're doing research on the stock. But somebody out there is doing a lot more research than you, okay? Like, one of the things that blew my mind was when I heard that hedge funds were taking satellite photos of parking lots outside retailers to see, <laughs> like, how many people were going in the stores, right? So no matter how much information you think you have, somebody has more information than you, and you as an individual trader are going to be at an information disadvantage. So the question is, if you're going to be at an information disadvantage, how are you going, where are you going to get your advantage, right? What is your edge? Okay. Is it sentiment? Is it charts? Is it something else? Is it, you, you, you have to have some kind of process because research alone isn't going to get you there, at least based on publicly available information. So. That's an amazing point. And you're right. And, and all, and there's so many of those professionals. That's why, that's what we talk about. How do you at least reclaim a little, they've got such an edge and an advantage. How can you, um, skill yourself? I think that's what Raul's always talking about, right? How can you use the tools available to increase your knowledge so that you're operating from a place of making informed decisions and not just sort of, you know, getting thrown around by the last bit of information that's coming. And that's hard, Tony, because that's usually when most people get stuff is when it's sort of, you know, made the rounds. What what, what about you? What are your thoughts? You know, I, I think I've always been of the survivor mentality and like, you know, I'm, 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 um, oh, whatever my, my point that I wanted to make regarding this was I, the best way to do that is to remove as much emotion from the trade as you can. Right. And to me, that just entails like, you know, if you have the right risk reward on, which entails being patient and, you know, getting into the positions that you want to buy lower and being quick with the ones that are breaking out and like being being really on top of your game. The bottom line is you're looking at that chart and you're saying, okay, I can risk it getting back below these moving averages on the downside. And that's my stop loss. And I have a target of let's see where I think it can go. I think it can go here. So if you kind of get into a trade and you put those two points on the board and you put alarms in your market watch systems that wake you up at those levels, you have to be non-emotional enough to be like, oh, okay, this is a sale because it's breaking down below my price. And I understand there may be other things going on in the world that may make me want to not sell it or whatever, but at some point I have to live and die by that discipline Mm -hmm. or else you start making an excuse for every trade and then the framework is out the window. Right. So you got to at some point abide by the framework. And what the framework does for me is it just lets me say, okay, I lost a couple percent on this trade. Small losses are beautiful for me. You know what I hate? Big ones. So I've learned to accept small losses and not accept big ones. And so it's kind of like, you know, you're kind of spinning your PL around to the fact that with a trailing stop mechanism, I can let my profits run. And if I'm stingy about the positions I put on and don't like to give up more than a couple of percent and demand that I don't lose 20 on anything, God forbid, you force yourself into a like non-emotional, got to trade this because it's breaking out, got to sell that because it's breaking down, emotionless trading framework, you know, and that's what works the best for me. And that's how I feel when I turn the screens on. I feel very relaxed. The stuff that I have on, I'll part with it in a minute. 
stuff that I don't have on, I'll put it on my pad before you can blink. And at that point, it's just managing the risk. And so to me, that, that that's kind of one of the more important things is to say, okay, can I establish a good three to one ratio here or, you know, with a one loss and a three parts profit or a one to four? I'm going to put that on and let that work all day by itself. If I have to wait a little bit to be patient, I can do that. If it's one of the things that I'm breaking out on and I've got to be there immediately, I can switch that gear too. But the bottom line is as long as I have a tight risk on the downside and much bigger reward on the upside, totally manageable, no sweating, no hemming and hawing, and I can just trade the thing. Yeah, it's guardrails, right? Guardrails are helpful. <laughs> they keep That's us right. intact. They keep us totally. in these amazing stuff. Um, and this is this is all wisdom. We always appreciate you sharing it. It's wisdom that's hard, hard won. I mean, earned. Um, both Tony and Jared have done uh, my life before trades with me, including two of their worst trades. So you can get a little background on how they came to all this knowledge and to this process that they use. Because I think you know making those mistakes and failing um, is often the best teacher, and that is part of you know why they are as good as they are now. And we're so grateful to both of you for being part of our community, for being in the RV marketplace and being able to share your research with our community so that they can kind of, um, you know, get on the path to profitability. Um, I feel like it's more needed now because, you know, in that zero interest rate, just, you know, um, set and forget kind of environment we were in, um, it fueled a lot of the passive behavior that we're all accustomed to. But things are changing. People are living longer. Things are more volatile. It's harder. So we all need to kind of up our skills. So we really appreciate both of you being part of that journey. Absolutely. Happy to share everything, Maggie. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And it's damn fun to read their it stuff is. too, I have to say, which is which makes it easier. It's not drudgery. It's super fun. We appreciate your sure. sense of humor too. Great to start the week and day with you guys. Thanks so much. We'll see you soon. Great Take job, care, Maggie. Everybody. Thank you. 